All righty. Here we have the start of the Sydney two-hour. So the Formula St. George two-hour endurance race. So we managed to qualify fourth. You hear us getting yelled at over the tannoy there. <laughs> These photos uh, were from an incident. Just as we were, I was exiting pit lane to do our siding lap, I realised I'd forgotten my armband. So I stopped frantically in pit lane, yelling and screaming, and uh, teammate Carl came running down, co broken collarbone and all. The ever wonderful Ben Burke managed to get an armband to us sooner. So we got out there, it was all good. You can see it's a Le Mans start, it's a typical endurance race start. Across the track, and the race starts off the raising of the national flag. Now, I am not built for sprinting. You can see the children on either side of me, quite small. <laughs> well, I can't get to the bike very quickly. The uh, Gen 3 SV does manage to get off the line fairly well. You can see uh, Lockie Eppis there getting away pretty well on his 400. And then Zach Johnson again there on the RS660. But I decided to take no prisoners on the, the start of this race. Had tyres from Saturday in it and I was kind of used to running a more full fuel, fuel load from Saturday but this was a lot this was full this was the tank was gunnelled trying to get as much uh, fuel into it as we possibly could to try to extend the stints for as long as possible our goal was to only do one uh, set of rider swaps so me swapping out from Matt and then Matt swapping back to me we didn't want to have to do a two uh, sorry a three stop strategy like some of the other teams had to because of their limited fuel range. I had a pretty good start, so it was pretty cool to, to jump in the lead. Uh, again, you see me running wide and not getting to the gas in places where I normally would, just learning the, you know, the extra six, seven kilos of weight being carried up a bit taller on the SV, as well as the suspension settings that we adjusted to, to take into, into account for that. I was actually pretty stoked that uh, Zach didn't come screaming past me into the flip-flop here on the, on the first lap, so that was pretty cool. Now, it's funny, everyone says endurance racing, you've got to be careful, you know, you've got to settle into your rhythm pretty quickly, but uh, for us, the plan was me to go out and do the first, you know, sprint race distance of that eight to 10 laps just hammer it as fast as I could and then try to settle for a rhythm. Which is funny because coming into, I think it was the third or fourth lap, so the third flying lap, full fuel load, you know, running the bike heavy. Uh, I actually managed to get a PB, an all-time PB on the bike, which was pretty cool. You can hear us still, like we didn't manage to get uh, a sprocket in between days to uh, be able to allow me to run longer gearing so you can hear I'm still having that really high over rev into corners at certain points again I'm hitting limiter where I would never have done in the past again the competition this weekend has just forced me to uh, you know push harder than I ever have so pushing beyond the capability of what our current setup was which isn't a bad thing, you know, it definitely is a, is a sign, a mark of you know, improvement that anyone can see if they watch this or listen to how we ride compared to our previous videos, you know, when we're doing 43s and 44s. All of a sudden you're doing 42s and then 41s. You know, you need to start adjusting the bike out. Again, you heard me hit the limiter there. Now, I think Zach was going to come past me anyway, but that definitely made that overtaking manoeuvre easy for him. You can see here though, mid corner, you probably have very similar corner speed. I get into the throttle earlier than Zach does. Um, but again, this is a perfect example of what 15 horsepower difference looks like. We are recording this voiceover a couple of weeks after the event and I've actually had my bike dynoed at CNM Motorcycle since because we thought something was wrong with the, the Woodlitz fueling and we were correct. And the bike, as it sat, rolling away from this track on this weekend, 75 horsepower. You see Zach running wide there, 
took full advantage of it. It's probably a bit of a nasty move running him out wide, but that's racing, trying to force people into mistakes, especially in endurance racing. Now, we didn't touch, it was nice and close, but again, we've got to start uh, thinking about strategy and if you can start getting to the head of the other rider and maybe force a mistake, that's what we've got to do. Now you can see there, he just outbraked me. Bit of venom uh, in a pass, which is perfectly fine, you know, that's, they're trying to do the same thing we are. And you can hear there, you can even see it. I'm into the gas either at the same time or just before, and they're still able to just march away up the hill. Now, those bikes, um, Ben said that when he had them dynoed at Harley's joint at RB Racing, they made a bit over 90 horsepower. Ours made 75 horsepower. You know, that's, that's a, an enormous difference. We make a bit more torque, but we're heavier. You know, it's just the ebbs and flows of how the bikes make the power and the design of the bikes. But the RS660s are amazing machines uh, and it really, you, know, you can see they really stick it to us and we try as hard as we might. You know, we can't make up that disparity on the straight. It might even be this lap that I, uh, I did the 41. The 41.7 I think it was, which is a, a PB. Now, I remember when I first started riding R6s, I was doing 45s and 44s on my R6, and it took me a long, long time to get under a 42 on an R6 at 120 horsepower. You know, on the same dyno, or 115 horsepower on the same dyno that we got this bike dyno on with 75. And a couple of years later, and we're doing some pretty crazy things on these little 650s. There's a bit of a noise just there, and I think that's actually the fairing dragging. You see there, just starting to use all of the track. It's one of those things you just start making little mistakes here and there. You're going a lot faster than I ever have before. And while I did try to settle into a bit of a rhythm, you know, you can see the, the enemy, so to speak, up in front. You still do have that little bit of a red mist there. The goal was to try to keep as close to them as you can across, uh, over the course of our first stint. Try to go a bit longer on fuel than they do. And you know, if you keep the pressure on, hopefully force them into a mistake. Then that's a bit of a knife edge. You've got to make sure that you don't then go and make a mistake yourself by overdoing it. Which, you know, I've, this, this year, I've done that this year, you know. So I had to be mindful of that. Push, but not too hard. So this is a, a couple of laps in, we come across our first back marker. This is uh, Glenn Jackson, who had a bit of a very unfortunate start to the Saint, Formula St. George two hour. Had uh, some issues getting across to the bike and then the bike wouldn't start. So we came across him fairly early in the race. But these things happen. So coming up on Demi, one of our friends uh, and fellow Sydney West Rider staff members. I managed to go past here and I gave her a bit of a thumbs up as I went past. She actually said that it was uh, very encouraging and she uh, ended up going a little bit quicker on the back of some encouragement, so that's pretty cool. And we start making some more passes on some 400s. The old CBR and ZXR 400s. I think there's even a Yamaha 400 in here somewhere. I think this bike in front of us here, I think that is a really lovely ZX400. You can see it's not shy of a bit of top end. We're just able to get them into this flip flop, which is one of my favorite overtaking spots at Eastern Creek here. You see me have a bit of a moment there, again, full fuel load. It was quite cool. Uh, and I was having a few issues going into there, a bit of chatter on the front end. Had a bit of a moment there and you know, I thought I was going to crash. I have crashed there this year. Unfortunately, uh, Mick Jeffrey on the, the Kramer was behind me and was right up my tailpipe. And um, unfortunately, when I had that moment, he uh, had a moment as well and crashed. 
So they were fighting us directly for second place in the race. I had that bobble, he had a bobble. Unfortunately, he went down on the Kramer. and had to uh, run the bike back to the pits. This is Stu Kitson, Carl's dad, on their other SV650, so I managed to come past him. Give him a cheeky leg wave as I get off the corner. This is again coming past Demi a couple of laps later. So in front of us is uh, Dustin. He's on the second of the two Kramers. So it's another Kramer 690 race bike. Wonderful bikes. Dustin and Rico, really nice people. They import the Kramers into Australia as well as the Helite airbag systems. I managed to actually draft him down the straight. It's the first time I've been able to do that for a bit. I know Dustin's a pretty good rider and he had a fairly good Saturday, so I was covering the line here, going in nice and tight. looking at the data seems to be the favourite line for the SV. But like I said at turn nine it's quite cold today. Turn three caught a lot of people out and unfortunately right behind us there the second of the two Kramers were down behind us with dust in the board and then that was that for them for their endurance race. They were done and they retired which truly is a shame because you know that's a great team great pair of bikes. But positive note for Mick he went on to race the five hour uh, and he was on the team with Lachlan Epis uh, and they managed to take out the overall win in the five hour. So while it wasn't so good for their, uh, for, for Mick's two hour, managed to go get the W in the five hour, which is pretty cool. Again, this is starting to get towards the end of my stint and I start making mistakes. I start getting tired, fatigued. You know, I haven't done any physical prep for this. So I had, I was quite sick, uh, I lost, uh, a lot of weight and not in a good way. Uh, had very little bike time fixing the bike after the last race meetings crash. And they're not wanting to be rude to people that we know as well. Again here, again, you can see mistakes starting to creep in. Been on the bike for 35 plus minutes, running almost PB lap times the whole time, so I'm stressing myself and the bike pretty hard. And I, I knew my stint was coming to a close soon. Probably shouldn't have been looking at my lap timer as much as I was. Uh, to see the, the time elapsed, the number of laps that I've done, as well as uh, how much fuel I had left. Coming up past H, she's having a very good race, teamed up with Demi. See my knee slider going across the ground there. So unfortunately we didn't get the end of my session. So I stayed out for 42 or 43 minutes in my first session. Sent Matt Franco out. Um, when I pitted we were in second and then when Matt made it back out we were still managed to be in second place so we had a really good pit stop. Bye -bye. You hear me call my bike, I sit on the bike and then Matt comes in. Dad, that's my dad there on the left. He takes the armband off Matt and puts it onto my arm. No dilly dallying, straight into gear, away we go. Um, Matt's stint was really good. He'd done three laps on our Gen 1 SV650 in the morning in morning warm up. Uh, we then had to put new tyres into it. Matt went out, and did an amazing job. You know, having only done three laps on the bike, he went out there, took him maybe a handful of laps to get used to the machine. And then he was running, you know, 45s, 44s, getting faster and faster throughout the whole race. And I think he ended up getting like a 44.6 or a 44.7, something like that, uh, which is faster than he had managed on Carl's bike the previous day. But again, he did 45 minutes on track. Uh, towards the end of his stint, Matt was saying that he was having a few chatter issues, so he checked the tyre pressures. Um, unfortunately, they were uh, quite out of spec. They were quite a lot higher than they should have been. We've put that down to the fact that the rims, again, it was a very cold morning on the Sunday. Put the warmers on so the rubber was up to temp, but the wheels uh, were still ice cold, essentially, when we, when we put them into the bike. So I think what happened was he went out and then everything's started to heat up and it just started to overpressure the tire. So we were, you know, five plus PSI out 
front and rear, which is obviously going to cause a few issues. I think had they been ideal at the ideal pressures, plus or minus, you know, a couple here or there, I think Matt would have probably been on for 43s uh, without the chatter. And uh, he was actually, he said to us after the race, he was worried about uh, making sure he kept Old Faithful upright because that is our original track bike or mostly our original track bike and race bike and you know, we love that bike. He knows that, so he was trying to be very careful with it. So now we're into my second stint. I managed to do a lot of hydrating, hydrolyte, uh, vitamins, water, uh, a bit of energy refill with some caffeine, some bananas, you know, light food. I've always found in sprint racing that I can't really eat too much throughout the day. It, it does upset me, but with the endurance racing, you do have to eat, you do have to drink, so just have to be careful with what you're eating and drinking. Luckily, it was a cool day, so you're not doing a heap of sweating or perspiring or whatever, but you still have to be mindful. So this is uh, passing Glenn Allerton, three times Australian Superbike champion. Um, so it was it's pretty cool to say we passed Glenn Allerton, uh, but you can see the top speed difference there between between the bikes is pretty big. So they were about three seconds a lap uh, behind us, so they were hammering on those bikes, you know. Also, just of note, Glenn Allen and his uh, nephew, they came third in the race. You see, this is H. Running some pretty amazing mid-corner speed through turn one. You know, you, did, you saw there, I didn't close the gap. Um, around turn one, it was only on the brakes into two that I managed to catch her. So she's coming on in leaps and bounds, which is really awesome to see after the first couple of rounds. That's the one thing about endurance racing as well. You're on the bike for so long, you start to learn things, you know. You have a lot of clear track time. You can learn what the bike's doing. This is coming up on David on his MT-07. I managed to give him a, a friendly salute as we passed him on the straight. And just as note, David, if you do watch this, you could see that your changing gear with a clutch and not a quick shifter is what made it very easy for me to pass you. So David, get a quick shifter. You can see Zach's come past me here. So during the race, uh, so when we swapped to Matt, probably two or three laps later after Matt, um, Zach pitted and Tom Taparas went out on his RS660. I would think he didn't get uh, a whole lot of way through his stint uh, when they suffered a technical issue and um, Tom had to park it up and run his armband back to the team and then Zach went out. So that's why Zach came past me so early. Lucky that Zach, like that, they were ready with their, their other bike because Zach was able to get back out and uh, jump back in the lead. Again, you can see the uh, huge difference between the bikes. You know, don't get me wrong, Zach and Tom are very good riders. 15 horsepower is 15 horsepower. Again, fall into that uh, that habit of, you know, you're seeing the really fast rider go, go out in front and, uh, and wanting to chase them. But I knew that I was only going to start dragging myself into more mistakes. So I took it easy. A bit of a... Uh, funny moment coming in halfway through my second stint coming up on Craig White so this is actually uh, our tyre supporter Craig White of White's Racing Products I probably could have sent a move there but it's Craig's first race meeting in a, quite a number of years uh, and we're mates and he's one of our supporters so I thought it probably best not to send a fairly risky uh, move on him so we did thank me for it later uh, if anyone can figure out what this bike is, uh, I would like to hear about it because it looks like maybe a Ninja, sorry, a ZX400 or a CBR400 chassis, but maybe it's got an ER6 motor in it, I'm not sure. But um, it was not shy of a bit of oomph off the corners and out, out down the straights. You know, compared to the early laps and from the sprint races, you can might be able to pick up that my 
gear points and my lines and the way I'm moving the bike has started to relax a bit. Again, starting to get through to the second half of the, the second stint. Um, I was definitely starting to get very tired. Um, I'm not very fit, I'll freely admit that. Minimal bike time and no physical prep. Uh, and then, you know, injuries from the past start to plague me. Um, no excuse, still had to push through it. Many others did as well, but we started to do some inventive things like standing up in the saddle, throwing a leg out. Here's passing David again at almost the same spot. So managed to get David off the last corner and give him another salute. And then this is H in front of us again. You can see her line through turn one is pretty good. Mid corner speed for the pair of us is about the same. And then I just have a bit more gas between one and two and then a bit more brakes down into two. Didn't run a little bit wide, but managed to V it off pretty well. So that's it, this is us coming across the finish line for the end of the St. George Motorcycle Club Formula St. George Class two hour endurance race. So I did uh, 42 or 43 minutes in my first stint, Matt Franco did a 45 minute stint in the middle, and then I closed it out with another 43 or 44 minute stint. I can tell you it was certainly a relief to, uh, to finish the race, not having to be running at full pace the whole time. You know, I had to do the full lap of the course and I made sure to give a big wave and a big thumbs up to all the marshals at every marshal point on the way around. Now at this point I had no idea where we'd finished. Uh, we did have a pit board up but the pit board was just telling us laps, plus, minus and when to pit. Again waving to the marshals. Without uh, all of these marshals who volunteer their time on weekends, this racing doesn't go ahead so it's always good to to give them a good wave. There's one thing for us all to acknowledge them on Facebook, social media, and even in the um, in the interviews at the end of the weekend, but to actually physically, you know, give them a big thumbs up and a big wave. They all appreciate it. They come and give us a pat on the back afterwards and say thank you. So again, massive thank you to all the St. George staff, volunteer marshals, the volunteers behind the scenes, up in the tower. You know, without all of them, this racing doesn't happen. I just want to say a big thanks to all our, our supporters and sponsors. Uh, that's what makes this happen for us and all the help that we get from everyone. Um, and then massive thanks to Andrew and my dad who you know, helped me rebuild the bike. Massive thanks to Dad for coming out of retirement, so to speak, to come and assist us in the pits from changing wheels, fixing issues uh, as they came up uh, and just helping out in the pits when needed. Even <laughs> things as small as passing me water or reminding me to eat. Uh, big thanks to Carl Kitson uh, and his partner Jess for being awesome in the pits and all the assistance that they gave. As always, it's a great atmosphere in the pits with our little team. Uh, which is pretty cool. And again, huge, huge thank you to Matt um, for coming in last minute, coming, getting on the bikes and absolutely having it. Pulling up, I just passed Craig White on the back straight there, so I was uh, pulling up here to give a bit of a handshake and a fist bump coming into pit lane. And this is definitely a far more sedate pace uh, entering pit lane at the end of the race compared to uh, my pit stop in the middle. It was certainly far more frantic coming in there. You don't want to waste time anywhere. Uh, especially coming into the pits, it's already long enough coming into the pits. So. Again, thanking everyone. It's awesome to see uh, all the contenders coming out of their pits, whether they were involved in the two hour or not, whether they were waiting for the five hour, everyone came out, clapping everyone on. So, pulling up with the team. A couple of the nice photos there from Nick Eddards of Half Flight. Pulling up to Park Ferme. This is a pretty cool experience, you know. MotoGP style park for me with the podium right there. Your number one through three board. Pretty cool.
Yeah. We've just done one lap. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it looks like that with your sweat, mate. Well done. Thank Second you very place. much. Come well. So it was a good time. As it, mate, you look like you enjoyed it out there. Ah, uh, mate, um, stoked. We've PBs, both sessions, it's just unreal. Awesome, mate. Unreal. And then Matt Franco riding my uh, old faithful this week. It's mate, you enjoyed awesome. it? Both weeks, man. It was mate, so well awesome. Done. Mate, thank you so much for turning up. Yeah, yeah. Mate, Franco, yeah. SV60. Yeah, good. Mate, that's all right, mate. So you're not a virgin anymore. <laughs> You've experienced the, uh, the dark side of the twins. I know what real power feels like now. So from an R1 to this, mate, yeah. what's the, uh, the story? I don't know, mate. You know, just it? I'm slowly going into retirement. You know? so nah, right. I'm well, I'm seeing with the bulge, mate. It's like... <laughs> no, that's because I got a kid on the way. Oh, that's <laughs> sympathy, mate. Well done. Congratulations. Second place, Sounding all the way through. Second place, Sounding all the way down to the finishing line on the two-wheel wheel deal entry. Brian Holtz and Matt Franco. Well done. Congratulations to you, guys.